Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to another episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I'm Adam, your co-host. Adam, we've often talked about how MFA is one of the best methods of defending against identity compromise, right? You, yep. There's a statistic that you cite where it's 99 some percent effective um, mm-hmm. to clamp down on your security posture. And there are a lot of different forms of MFA. Very basically, a lot of people use SMS, which is just a text message to a phone number that is susceptible to something called a SIM swap, where it has been demonstrated that attackers can contact your cell phone provider and social engineer a way to get your information or your accounts switched to a brand new SIM, get them the SIM put in, you know, swap to a different physical SIM and then put that into their phone and be able to get the text message and essentially bypass your phone and your SIM is no longer any good. So that is a a documented way to do that as well as OTP, which is called one time password or passcode. Those are generally soft tokens or an app. There's the app prompt, which there's a lot of different ways apps can prompt for MFA these days, something like a simple approve or disapprove or yes, no, some of them it can include some location context, like a lo- GPS location or where that's coming from. There's also things like number matching. And then physical security keys, often known as FIDO2 compliant hard tokens. So those are kind of some of the different methods of MFA. Recently, some cyber criminal groups such as Lapsus and Cozy Bear, which is a Russian state-sponsored uh, cyber criminal group, they were actually responsible for the solar winds hack. They have been able to defeat some of the weaker MFA methods through basically a, a simple human reflex that we all can attest to where they will keep on prompting the user or somehow get the user to accept the MFA prompt and therefore bypassing it. And it's basically being called MFA bombing. And I say that it's kind of familiar to all of us because one of the things that I do all the time now is I look at that cookies uh, notification for every website that pops up. And sometimes I'll go through and select only the necessary ones and take away the advertising ones. But sometimes I'm just like, well, I don't really have the time or really care. I really need to see this site and I just want this notification to go away and I'll just hit accept all. And that's just kind of the, for most users, if you're getting constantly prompted for something, the reflex is just going to be hitting okay. So many MFA providers will allow users to accept a phone push and the the threat actors will eventually get access once they they accept that. And because there's no limit placed on, say, how many times the app can prompt or a phone call can be placed or whatever, however that MFA request is being given, they can call an employee 100 times or prompt them 100 times in the middle of the night. Maybe you have your phone on and it's dinging or it's ringing and you just hit the accept button and then you're in. So fundamentally, it's basically a single method of compromise, tricking the user into acknowledging the MFA request. But there are a lot of different forms of that attack. It could be sending a bunch of MFA requests and hoping they accept one or sending one or two prompts per day. And that may attract less attention, but there's still a good chance that they will accept the MFA request. And then you could call the target and pretend to be part of a company telling the target they need to send an MFA request as part of a company process. Now that's also pretty tricky and stealthy. And I think it may have a pretty high success rate against the unsuspecting targets, right? 
So one thing worth pointing out here before everybody kind of goes and jumps off a cliff is all these methods still require the attackers to have the user's password, right? So this is still multi-factor authentication. This is a second additional factor that now they're trying to break through. Now, admittedly, it's pretty easy to get at least one or more users' passwords because for the most part, all you have to do is ask and they'll eventually give it to you. However, just want to clarify that MFA, any MFA, even these MFA methods that have these kind of flaws that Lapsus and other groups are now compromising is still better than just username and passwords. So don't throw the baby out with the bathwater here. I think that's an important concept. And really also just to clarify what we're talking about here are methods where I as the end user don't have to interact with anything other than just accepting the prompt. So I get a phone call and it says, this is a phone call from the multi-factor authentication verification service. Press one to approve your authentication. And if you get that phone call over and over every night at 1 a.m., eventually you might accept it. Or you get a tech or a push notification that sends you to some sort of authenticator app and requests you to approve it. So those are the, the methods we're talking about where this, this risk really comes into play, where I don't have to do anything else in order to accept it. It's just that single like tap accept push one where it goes through. Now, as an example where you can harden this and Andy will tuck on it a little more is we mentioned many, many weeks ago now on this show that for Microsoft consumer accounts, as an example, you can now go full passwordless where you don't even have a password. Your password is actually deleted for your Microsoft consumer account. I went ahead and did that. So the result of that now is if anyone listening to this show goes and plugs my Microsoft consumer account in and tries to sign into xbox.com or, or the Microsoft store, the first thing it does is sends a push to my app on my phone, my Microsoft Authenticator app. Now that push is different because it's going to request me to match a number. Well, I don't know what the number is to match. So even if I'm getting you know bombed with that request, this new kind of method, I wouldn't know what to do anyways. So I can't you know, fall victim to this even accidentally, even if I accidentally tap something because there's that additional prompt. So just want to clarify what we're talking about here. Um, the, the methods that are susceptible to this versus not. And, uh, certainly again, just, just wanted to make the point that although this is a concern and this is kind of the next level of security is now using more secure methods of multi-factor authentication. This is in no way, shape or form saying MFA is bad and you shouldn't use it just so we're clear on that yeah for sure mfa is something you need to do it's just that there are concerns now with this mfa bombing that companies need to be aware of when they're implementing their mfa and kind of looking at their policy and how to implement it and i'm glad you mentioned the password list because some idps when they implement password lists they don't go to that contextual information where it's coming from, number matching, all of that, because it, if it is just a simple prompt, which I have seen at, at some IDPs where you're implementing password lists, it literally, you're just taking away the password part. Not that it doesn't exist still, but for SaaS apps, you're not prompted for the password and it just goes to the MFA prompt on your phone and there's no additional context. It's just a accept or decline and that's it. A lot of IDPs are starting to implement GPS, but one of the problems with coordinates and geographical context is our ISPs, internet service providers, have pipelines that egress all over the United States. And your IDPs will use these pipelines. And so for a user, it can be confusing because if I'm getting a prompt and it's saying, Redmond, Washington. Well, I don't live there. I mean, why is my MFA prompt coming from there? Well, it could be that it's taking that route because Microsoft is using that particular pipeline to send me that prompt. If I'm on my Wi-Fi, it may show my local ISP, but if I'm on my phone and my LTE 5G connection, 
my cell phone provider has egress points all over the United States. They may route it through Texas or California or somewhere else. And so for users, it can be confusing. But what I have found is, in general, if you're using a particular IDP, they will usually see the same egress points over and over again. So as a security defender, you'll know, okay, it's coming from Virginia. Oh, it's coming from Texas. Like the same spots will be coming for your locations if it is the same IDP. And then you may get additional, I guess, variants if users are traveling. They may say, oh, I'm going to Madison, Wisconsin, but my traffic is coming from Green Bay or something like that. And it's eh, close enough, right, that their traffic may be routed through somewhere else. So that's what I would say about that is there needs to be some education when it comes to the geographical ones. I always told my users that take a look at the holistic picture. Did you actually sign into something? And then it says, I'm going to prompt you for something. And then if it did prompt you, then you know that, okay, I just tried to sign in. It's prompting me. I'm getting prompted, but the geographic location doesn't look correct, but at least the timing works out fairly similar. So that's probably what I would say and try to educate on how those MFA and how the internet pipeline works. You don't have to dive into too much detail, but that's, that's in my experience where some of the confusion comes from with the extra context. And then for the, the next part, where Adam, you're talking about the number matching. Mm-hmm. That's such a huge thing to, to look at because like you said, if someone tries to prompt me now at Microsoft or for my Microsoft consumer account, it will prompt me for a number to match. And if I don't have that in front of me, like I didn't sign into something and it's showing me the number to match, then I can't even match that. Right. So the, original way that this was implemented was it gave you three numbers where you could actually still put in or like guess one of three, which at 33% chance, I mean, there's a chance that you could select the number, but the newest way for MFA, if you go into authentication methods in Azure is you actually have to type in the number. Well, now you have a one in 99 chance or whatever the, the number is to type that in. And that, lowers the chance of you accidentally guessing the right number by a significant portion. So I really like the new way of doing it where I actually have to type in the number Mm -hmm. versus just selecting three numbers because then I know for sure that it's whatever number I'm seeing, I'm entering in on my phone. Agreed. I really like that number matching where it's just type it. I don't think it, it saves that much time to do the, you know, the pick one of three and obviously you have another 33 times risk reduction there. So I think a no brainer. And I like that methodology better on geographical context. So there's some historical information here. Microsoft is an IDP Azure active directory. And it's only recently rolling out graphical context for notifications. This is a new thing and it's still in preview and it's still opt in. So it's not even enabled by default, but you can turn it on now if you want to. And I used to have customers ask me like, why don't you guys have this? You know, your competitors have this. And sometimes there's the perception, you know, a little inside baseball about work is people would think like, oh, you, you, you guys just haven't done that yet. you know, why haven't you gotten around to it? And I would always position it as, you know, we have plenty of engineering resources. We have plenty of money. It's a matter of, we don't think that's the right approach because that's so hit or miss. And I can tell you just anecdotally, me personally, I have fiber to the home, which is awesome through a company called Metronet, which is a small uh, pure fiber connection. And it's great, by the way, not, not a sponsor of the show, but if you have Metronet in your local area, love them. Their, their gigabit up and down service is incredibly cheap and super good. However, their default behavior is you're behind a like commercial grade NAT for your service, unless you pay more to get a static IP. So me being a geek, I wanted that static IP. So I went ahead and did that. So I paid them like an extra 10 bucks a month for it. And so now I have a static IP and for whatever reason, Microsoft always identifies that static IP. And now this is, this is just a complete coincidence as coming from the Puget sound area, coming from the Seattle area, 
which you know is where Microsoft space, but has nothing to do with that. Um, even on devices that aren't enrolled, you know, in any sort of VPN or anything, they still identify that way. So it's just IP geolocation is hard and it's not an exact science. And so I know again, Andy, to your point, I used all those other bits of um contextual information. Did I request it? Is the timeliness right? Does the number matching work? You know, all those things. So I I have learned now that the geolocation is just wrong for my IP address. Um and you know, I as a technologist can understand that. I know IP geolocation is hard. But this is why, like, that added context is not completely cut and dry because it could be confusing to users and it may not be helpful. So, you know, it, it's where people have asked for it and always said, you know, more information is always better. Well, inaccurate information is not always better. So if you train your users for other things to look for, that can be more effective. And that number matching is really good as well. You know, and one other thing to think about, Andy, you were kind of talking about, again, like, is this, is this abnormal or not? Another control you can put in place here, if your IDP supports it, is if it has some sort of like real-time risk scoring or anomaly detection compared to normal user logins. Now, a default behavior a lot of people will do is they'll configure that just for if risk is higher, prompt for MFA. Obviously, today, you should always prompt for MFA. And your system should just be in place so that we don't get regular MFA prompts because that MFA is remembered, even though policy always requires it. What you should instead do is use elevated risk as a straight up block is, is kind of the current guidance and recommendation. So if we're seeing anything anomalous in your IDP where that's not where a user si normally signs in, that's not a device they normally use, let's block that sign in until we know better. And that would also help prevent against a lot of these attacks as well, where you can use that behavioral baseline we've established for a user to say they normally sign in from here on this device. And if we see something very anomalous, you know, a, a, an elevated risk, significant elevated risk, we're not going to allow that sign in. Now, most of these IDPs are smart enough today to recognize like, okay, this user took their same laptop they always use and they went to a different location. That's a little bit of elevated risk, but not a lot because a lot of that was still the same. When we see new location and new device, yeah, now's when we, we sound the alarm a little bit and we go to medium or high risk. So some other ways to protect against this as well, just know that the old strategy of just prompting for MFA for elevated risk is probably not sufficient to fully protect against this block. But if your IDP supports those real-time, you know, adaptive MFA or uh, sign-in risk kind of scenarios, if you can actually configure that to a block or require managed device, now you can get closer to a state where you can protect against these scenarios entirely. So some things to think about there. And then of course, the other thing we've talked about on the show is fish resistant MFA methods. And that's coming into more and more um, of security leaders uh, radar because there is now a requirement for the federal government and anyone who does business with the federal government to have fish resistant MFA methods starting to be implemented. And those are like security tokens, right? Like physical security keys, FIDO2 security keys. Those literally, if you ask me to uh, be prompted for MFA, I can't stick my USB into another person's device that's you know thousands of miles away who's trying to fish me one way that you could look at these you know they have a lot of different ones obviously usb is, is one of them but nfc we've talked about nfc um fido2 certified uh, security keys where vendors can implement like a physical access as well as logical access into those nfc cards so i can use the same card that i use to enter my building for physical access to the building and then scan my card through an NFC reader to satisfy an MFA requirement like for Windows Hello or for Azure AD or some other IDP, which a lot of IDPs also have NFC or FIDO2 compliant um, MFA to be available. So that's another way that you can look at it. And for those, you know, you may not need everybody. Like I know the cost can be a big one, right? Because you're looking at physical access cards plus logical access cards. If the cost is something that is a barrier, you can do some cost sharing because sometimes physical security is not the same as information security. 
as well as again not everybody needs nfc cards right nfc cards generally i would say are on maybe machines that you don't have assigned to a specific user if they're shared or kiosk machines nfc cards or fido2 compliant uh mfa methods are preferred for those especially for windows hello because there is a limitation in the tpm to have only a number of keys remembered for windows hello for business whereas that fido2 if you're using it for windows hello to sign into the machine that secret key is actually stored on the card itself or the usb itself rather than the tpm so there are ways to implement around the cost um and you can look at that but fido2 obviously is probably the standard for fish resistant today Absolutely. And Andy, in the show notes, you called out a couple of, of risks inherent in here as well. And going back several weeks ago now to our Lapsus episode, we talked about how Lapsus is doing a really good job of protecting those weak points in your security posture. So again, I'm not going to reference that XKCD comic for the millionth time, but here's yet another example where you can have this really strong security with a FIDO2 key. We have issued YubiKeys to all of our users. Fantastic. You know, Great. YubiKeys are awesome. FIDO2 is awesome. FIDO2 is pretty much unbreakable. But you know what's really breakable? The human element. If it is super easy to call up your service desk and say, hey, I lost my YubiKey, get me in. And I can break that process through relatively simple social engineering. Well, all of your security in the world has done you very little good, right? So this is where your process for users who've lost their YubiKeys needs to be extremely hardened compared to maybe what you had done in the past. Because if that's an easy end around, building all the security in the world around that has not really helped you a whole heck of a lot. Now again, social engineering attacks on the help desk are going to be very brazen, right? That That's, that's not the simple like commodity-based attack that a lot of cybersecurity attacks today are. But for those targeted attacks, especially if you're high profile, if you're something like critical infrastructure, you're absolutely at risk for those. And so your service desk protocols need to be very, very, very hardened as well. And I think that's an area people forget about. They get so hung up on the technology, you know, <laughs> 4,096 bit RSA encryption on this laptop. And and then they forget the, you know, drug them and hit them with a wrench kind of part of the security concept too. So keep that in mind. We love FIDO2 and on, on the Blue Security Podcast for sure. But there are still those little underbelly components that you got to think of as well. And um, that is just something to, to make sure you're considering. Yeah, and I think to kind of just wrap it all up, this is not anything new. MFA bombing or this type of attack is not something that we haven't seen before, but because it is starting to be used because MFA is becoming more and more ubiquitous, if you don't have MFA enabled, it's something that you need to go and do. So we're not saying don't to do it. But because it is becoming more and more ubiquitous, this is just a sneaky way to get around it, right? It doesn't take a whole lot of technical know-how. All you're doing is basically annoying the person until they f- do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's just a call out to just be aware of this. Look at your MFA configurations you know, are you using weaker forms of MFA? If you are, try to move to stronger ones. Are you using some sort of contextual MFA prompt? Are you using the number matching? Like we talked about for Azure AD, they have number matching. I know other IDPs have number matching. Like consider that to be at least a somewhat reduced risk profile. We talked about geographical, but you know, it is some information. If it was coming from say like Europe or Asia or something like that for me, that would raise a red flag. Mm -hmm. If it's within the United States, you know, it can be confusing for users if it's coming from a different state. So some education is needed. I don't think it's bad information, but it is, you know, one of those things that I take with a grain of salt Mm -hmm. and then conditional access rules, right? We talked about uh, the CISA um, warning or the advisory that, people were getting past uh, a specific MFA provider duo because the configuration was wrong. It it had been set to fail open. So maybe test your conditional access rules, how your MFA is set up 
make sure that it's not fail open. I, I would not want a fail open condition in, in my security posture. And then look at FIDO2, right? FIDO2 is the gold standard today for fish resistant MFA. It may not be cost effective for every single person in your organization. And we've talked often about how it may not be something you would implement for everyone, but maybe a subset, right, of higher elevated users, your admins for your IT organization, your C-suite, maybe people who are accessing proprietary information, stuff like that. So mm-hmm. that's my final thoughts. How about you, Adam? Nothing to add, Andy. I think you wrapped it up beautifully. That was our show for this week. Thanks for listening as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes if you guys have any questions or additional topics you want us to talk about. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.